Okay, so what Gordon's asked me to do is just kind of review kind of how natural selection works. That's all I'm going to spend the next hour to do that. That's my general goal. More specifically, I'll, by the time you're done, I want you guys to, be, to recognize, be able to identify, be able to describe the requirements for natural selection. That'll be helpful for your, your exam. <laughs> yeah, deciding whether natural selection should be operating or not, because sometimes it's not clear. You're like, yeah, I think it should be going, sometimes it's not. Um, but I also want you to be able to predict both the rate and the fate of natural selection when we're done. So will natural selection uh, reduce the amount of genetic diversity in the population, or will it maintain diversity? Um, so those are my general goals. And here's how I want to go about doing it. I'm gonna, I have a series of problems here, kind of evolutionary genetic problems. I'm gonna hand out this worksheet and you'll answer the problems and then we'll talk about them. And, hope, and, and I'll start off really unstructured, like I won't be really telling you anything. So we'll grapple with the problems and then after doing that, I'm gonna ask, like, what do we learn? And then we'll identify some general principles. And so most of the lecture is gonna be kind of talking about problems, seeing what we've learned, and then by the end, I'll give you another handout that ties all this together so it should be clear. Now my understanding is most of you guys have studied evolution before you had genetics. So hope, so I'm gonna assume you have a kind of passing uh, knowledge of how selection works. Um, if you ask a cognitive psychologist, like what's the most important thing a teacher should know for a classroom, it's like what the students know. I don't know anything about you guys. So these problems might be like really easy and we'll go quick. Or they might be like, oh my goodness, what is this stuff? And then if that's the case, we'll move slower, okay? So what I'll do is I'm gonna hand these out. Maybe we'll answer the first problem. We'll talk about it. We'll ask ourselves, what do we learn here? And then we'll do the second problem and we'll do that, okay? So Britt, can you help me hand these out? Advance for me. Sure. All right. Okay, so what Gordon's asked me to do is just kind of review kind of how natural selection works. That's all I'm going to spend the next hour to do that. That's my general goal. More specifically, I'll, by the time you're done, I want you guys to, be, to recognize, be able to identify, be able to describe the requirements for natural selection. That'll be helpful for your, your exam. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> deciding whether natural selection should be operating or not, because sometimes it's just not clear. You're like, yeah, I think it should be going, sometimes it's not. Um, but I also want you to be able to predict both the rate and the fate of natural selection when we're done. So will natural selection uh, reduce the amount of genetic diversity in the population, or will it maintain diversity? Um, so those are my general goals. And here's how I want to go about doing it. I'm gonna, I have a series of problems here, kind of evolutionary genetic problems. I'm gonna hand out this worksheet and you'll answer the problems and then we'll talk about them. And, hope, and, and I'll start off really unstructured, like I won't be really telling you anything. So we'll grapple with the problems and then after doing that, I'm gonna ask like, what do we learn? And then we'll identify some general principles. And so most of the lecture is gonna be kind of talking about problems, seeing what we've learned, and then by the end, I'll give you another handout that ties all this together so it should be clear. Now my understanding is most of you guys have studied evolution before you had genetics. So hope, so I'm gonna assume you have a kind of passing uh, knowledge of how selection works. Um, if you ask a cognitive psychologist, like what's the most important thing a teacher should know for a classroom, it's like what the students know. I don't know anything about you guys. So these problems might be like really easy and we'll go quick. Or they might be like, oh my goodness, what is this stuff? And then if that's the case, we'll move slower, okay? So what I'll do is I'm gonna hand these out. Maybe we'll answer the first problem. We'll talk about it. We'll ask ourselves, what do we learn here? And then we'll do the second problem and we'll do that, okay? So Britt, can you help me hand these out? Mm -hmm. Made some, put some on a barn. This, or an enclosure, what's it say, enclosure? It looks like it's a pretty good place for these mice, right? There's no predators, lots of food, there's really nothing to prevent them from surviving and reproducing. What's gonna happen? 
So she'd be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So the frequency of the genotypes would be P squared, 2 pq Q squared. The question doesn't ask about that. <laughs> um, the question asks what's going to happen to the frequency of uh, the colors. So let me tell you how my students answer this question. Half of them pick D. The percentage of white minus would be 25%. Another, I don't know, third will say the percentage of the white mice will decline. Well, let's just think about those answers. Why would you say the percentage of white mice would be 25%? What, why might that be an attractive answer? The genotype of homozygous recessive being, if Q squared being 25. If, well, hold on, so 25% Q squared. It's the phenotypic ratio, the Mendelian ratios. Right. So, you are Punnett square that you guys are using. Yeah, I'm right? doing Punnett square, square what sort of Punnett square? What kind? So, yeah. a Punnett square, the things inside depend on the genotypes. Mm -hmm. If you have both uh, heterozygotes. If they're both heterozygotes, yeah. then you'll have 25%. Right. Yeah. But that's not. But that wouldn't be white. But you, yeah, but, okay. Everyone's mind jumps to there, like, well, that should be what's going on here. But we don't really know what the frequencies of these will be. Mm -hmm. So what? It could be 90%, 10%. Now, some of, so, boy, there's not, there's no reason for it to be 25%. Now, we just mentioned the Punnett square. Do you guys know who Punnett was? Punnett was a geneticist at Cambridge that played a really important role in the rediscovery of Mendelian genetics. So this is kind of one of the giants in the history of biology. He thought that if you did this, the dominant allele would take over. Because it's dominant. So some of these answers, like the percentage of white mice will gradually decline, might be what he would pick. How does that answer? So is that, did that happen? People are shaking hands. So I want to explain why the brown allele won't take over. I mean, don't you just want to say, well, it's dominant. If there's no selection, so we've removed predators, right? And we have, depending on how big the population size is. Yeah, yeah. if there's no selection, it doesn't, the fact that an allele is dominant, mm -hmm. what's that tell you? It means it's, ex what it's ex it'll dominate in a heterozygous Genotype. The dominant allele will dominate the phenotype. It doesn't necessarily mean it dominates in the population, though. It right. totally has nothing to do with what will happen while they're dominating the population. So, what's the correct answer here? A. A, the percentage of white and brown mice will remain the same. So, the first thing I want to kind of emphasize is natural selection. The fate of natural selection is going to depend upon other things besides whether something is dominant or recessive. That tells you a lot about the phenotype. How phenotypes are related to genotypes. It doesn't tell you about the fate of natural selection. Okay. And in a, couple, in a couple slides, we'll review like what determines how natural selection works. And um, dominance and recessives will affect the rate of natural selection, but not the fate. Any questions on this? Okay, let's grapple with one more problem. We're doing well. Um, the second one, this, and then we'll go through that list and see if we can cross some off as maybe less likely than others. Okay. So we're talking about so whether someone can see clearly or not. That's a phenotype, right? So why don't we just start by asking, what determines phenotype? I have lots of, you know, my phenotype has many different trait characteristics. What determines my phenotype? This is the same thing for, you know, animals in the wild. What determines their phenotype? Genotype and, and, and environment. environment. So their environment, and what else? Genotype. Genetics. So if we're talking about a change in phenotype, there's two ways to do that. The environment could have changed, or their genetics could have changed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Is that, okay. So let's start by thinking, now, if P 
people are genetically different now than we're 100 years ago, what are we saying has occurred? What do you call a genetic change in a population? What's that? Evolution. Evolution, okay. So my question I'm asking you is, is could humans have evolved in the last 100 years to not see well? Okay. So let's, and we're talking about how that could have happened. So what could cause evolution like this. Tell me how this could occur. Thoughts? Selection. Selection, okay. So let's flush that out. Tell me how the selection story goes. Well, in the last hundred years, we, humans have seen a switch from more, I guess you could say, blue collar type jobs to more intellectual book, computer-based jobs. Things that are closer to your face. Uh -huh. So nearsightedness would actually could actually be considered an advantage. Oh, so it's more near. Modern you're saying so mm. being able to not see in the distance could be advantageous, mm -hmm. and individuals that cannot see, I'm just flush, flushing this out, would survive and reproduce better than contemporary American society. That would be the selection. A selection. Um. I guess, like, two, back 200 years ago, we were still hunting with rifles. And, uh -huh. you know, you need your sight. If you couldn't, then you couldn't provide for your family unless that eliminates it. But now with uh, agrarian culture, you raise cattle, but you don't need to see as far. So, um, so as, like, people got more agrarian, then people who probably uh, could uh, farm also had... Uh, nearsighted effects, and so um, the uh, because we became more industrious with our like farming, um, that started out competing the uh, hunter's ability to uh, pop populate. So you're making a selective advantage argument. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I guess, I guess in a way, uh, like because there was no need for like the be able to hunt. Like the sea far and like be able to shoot an animal. Oh, so now you don't. You, okay, you don't need to see well. You don't need to see well when you're on a farm when you're raising chickens or okay. dogs or raising chickens and cows. Now, someone over here was telling me something similar. They're saying, you know, we have food, we have medical care. Someone that doesn't see well now is going to be able to survive and reproduce. And that certainly wouldn't be true in caveman times. And I would think being half blind, you know, even 200 years ago would probably make it difficult for you to find, you know, a mate. So we no longer have a selective pressure on being able to see well. Mm -hmm. It's okay if you can't. Technology buffer is selective. Yeah, but I, I was legally blind. It really hasn't been a big handicap in my life, right? No more contacts, no more glasses, not have surgery. No big deal. 200 years ago, boy, that would have been a problem. So with that, can that explain how we got here? That there's no longer the selective pressure to see well. No. I see a lot of heads. Was someone nodding their head? Tell me how that works. So, the use, caveman days, you couldn't see, you weren't going to reproduce. No, it doesn't matter. Will that cause humans to not see in 100, 100 years? Someone, someone else besides Fred. I mean, unless like nine out of ten people had crappy eyes, like you know, it's like a super, super common mutation to have bad eyes, mm -hmm. which is really not. So hold on. Okay. We're we talking mutations, or are we talking? What happens when you stop selection? They like stay at the same. They stay at the same frequency. So, or basically, what I'm saying is that if you get a bunch of yeah, like if, if you have a bunch of people who see poorly in the caveman days, you're uh -huh. gonna, you, they're going to they're going to die. They're going to die, and so the people with good eyesight are going to go through. But you don't really like humans don't have that. Not nine out of ten people are born with like crappy eyes. And, like one person has good eyes, and it's like. So when you say nine out of ten born with bad eyes, like basically the, the whole point I'm trying to make is that there's not the hundred years isn't enough time for selection to happen in like a realistic situation with human eyesight. 
Unless there was like a crazy preferential yeah. Yeah. for well, like a mating well, success. Well, we've been talking about like sexual selection is one of the biggest natural selection driving forces. So when you switch from a uh, more hunter-gatherer agricultural to a more industrial society, there is a, I guess, more push towards the more intellect, more, and I mean, I think when books were starting, you know, small print, People were wearing glasses even when they didn't necessarily need them and bad lighting and stuff. Okay, so it pushed it. So if you're saying being nearsighted made it easier to find a partner and have kids, I get that. That if that was really an advantage for reproducing, the trait should in, could increase in frequency. And there are there are traits like that. But what I want to go back to this idea of like, well, all of a sudden now, being born with eyesight, which used to be terrible, with poor eyesight, used to be terrible. Let's just say caveman days, I would not have made it legally blind. And now, it doesn't matter. Can that explain this big shift? So people are saying no, but can you, why not? So if we're talking, hold on, let me just back up. We're talking about an evolutionary change. That means we're changing allele frequencies. Kind of like the mouse example, is you remove selection, it's not going to change the proportion of the initial um, trait. If you remove selection, it won't change the proportion of the trait. So if you stop selecting, what principle will govern how this population will evolve? Drift. Drift. And if the population is really big, what will happen to, like, if there's Good eye genes and bad eye genes, how will they change with time or not? What dictates, what, what will describe what will happen to people's vision? If there's a, a principle, you know it, we just, you just were talking to me about it. It'll, it will apply. What will govern it? Hardy Weinberg, right? So if there's selection going on, the, Frequencies of phenotypes will change. If you stop selection, hey, there's no selection. It doesn't really matter whether you can see or not anymore, which I think is probably pretty true. Mm -hmm. Then this trait will be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Equilibrium means no change. So if you stop selection, you're not going to increase the frequency of people that are nearsighted. So if you want to make a selective argument, you have to say, well, people that can't see very well you know, are sexy or they're, you know, they're sought after and they're going to have more kids. Glasses. Some people think glasses are sexy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if you, right, if you want to make that argument, I'll say, yeah, that makes sense. If you say, well, we're just stopping selection, so these genes are going to rebound or resurge or come out of the woodwork. Those are terms I've heard from <laughs> mm -hmm. students. It's like, well, it kind of makes sense. You might think they would, but evolution doesn't work that way. Right. You need something kind of driving it forward. So I think that it's probably a re relaxation of selection against, but also a selection against good eyesight. <coughs> because there's, I don't know if you're talking about the US or But we're saying there's no selection. There's, there's a relaxed selection against poor eyesight, but there's selection against good eyesight because. You think there's selection against good eyesight? Breeding males of a certain age probably go to war. And to get into the military, Ooh, probably. Oh, that's a good argument. Because how would they get out? Okay, so. So <laughs> feeble people increased <laughs> because yeah, they couldn't because go to World War II in Vietnam. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> well, I, I like it. His logic, I think, is sound. Yeah. I, I'd be surprised um, <laughs> be an awesome step. if the numbers worked out. Yeah. Okay, so relaxing selection, stopping selections is not going to cause like this trait to increase in frequency. What, but selection is just one cause of evolution. What other causes do we have? Migration, mutation. Migration. So maybe there's gene flow. Mm -hmm. Wait, does that work? Can we explain that maybe people with bad eyes have come from somewhere and <laughs> no, is this they all concentrated in one club? <laughs> yeah, this is this is true all around the world. About a third of people can't see, at least. Even in undeveloped countries. Um. That's, that's the one, yeah. 30% yeah, 30 is the global. Some countries like China now, apparently it's like 80, 90%. Um, but my guess is I haven't seen a data from Africa, but it's much lower there. So, okay, so it, 
The selection arguments you'd have to make would be a sexual selection, the idea that people that can see well are being killed in wars, that makes sense. Relaxing selection wouldn't do it. Um, or let's say gene flow really doesn't seem to work. What else causes evolution? Drift. Drift. How about a drift argument? Make a drift argument? Mm -hmm. Not if the population is so big. Okay. Yeah. Boy, I, yeah, I would say there's so many people in China or America, it's hard to come up with drift. And drift is a random process, and the same thing is happening kind of all around the world. Even if it was drift, you would expect it to become uh, at the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. You would expect it to kind of stabilize around there, wouldn't you? Uh, I guess you'd expect it to be go in different directions in different places. Right? Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't expect every place to go off. That's right, exactly. Yes, yeah, so, and there's so many people. I think it's hard to make a drift argument. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be just uh, records. We just can't have. I mean. 200 years ago, it was still in its infancy of you know, like. It's a bad yeah. yeah, I, I, I think that's a, certainly as a scientist, that's a good question. I think for the purposes of our discussion, let's assume that the change is real. And the data that I've seen suggests that it is. It isn't just a record keeping oh. thing. Okay, so different causes of evolution. Selection, we're like, boy, it's kind of hard. I say it's hard to make a good selected argument. Gene flow, like that doesn't work. Um, what else is there? Drift, but that doesn't really make a lot of sense. What else is there that causes evolution? Mutation. Mutation. Well, maybe this is mutation. What do you guys think of the mutation that bothers us? Pollution. Mutation. Well, no, let's work on mutation. Can mutation be responsible for this? Because, like, if you're born with a mutation that gives you bad vision, back in the day you weren't going to survive, and now you will. So it's kind of like the, that's still it's similar to the selection argument, etc. Yeah. It's like it's already being there. We're saying that a mutation arose because at the time it arose yeah. at a time where the mutation wasn't considered deleterious, so it wasn't yeah. being out of the population. Mm -hmm. So mutation would kind of cause this sort of trend. Now, what do you know about mutations? They're rare. So they're, they're really rare. Mm -hmm. If yeah, I mean. I, a mutation rate of one out of 10,000 or something like that mm -hmm. might be reasonable. You, you can't get there from here with that rare rate. So none of really our evolutionary hypotheses really seem plausible. Um, but now just to tell you kind of what the consensus is of what's going on, is we change the environment. You used to be hunting all day or farming, you're looking out in the distance, your eyes you know, are focusing out there. Now you spend a lot of your time reading up close, it affects the growth of your eyes. So. so it is selection. No, it's, it's but like not selection a for what? Well, but selection for what fits the environment? Like, well, as selection the causes changes. evolution. To say populations have evolved, to say the genes have changed. So it's not it's the not genes genetic. that's the genes changing. It's not changed genes all. are all the same, but the development of the eye yeah. post birth is different. Or birth yes. Birth or if birth. I grew up in yeah. caveman days, yeah. my vision would probably be just fine. Whereas if I hadn't spent my youth doing all that like reading. Right. It'd be interesting oh, to see. Oh, you mean development? Yes. So actually, that, has anybody studied that? Like looking at the physiology at birth and physiology at like 25? I don't know. I, there are some nice case studies of like among the Inuit. As soon as you put well, people in schools, their vision just went down. It would, it would have to be even sooner than that, though, because the I mean, there's they, my my three year old niece had glasses and she wasn't. What about so it's like <laughs> So the problem has to arise sooner than birth. You uh, think. It's amazing how little like. Medical research gets done with evolutionary sort of questions. Right. Anyway, so I don't think there's great, as men studied well. The purpose of those two discussions, though, was to get you to think about well, what do you need for natural selection to work? And when we come up with these sorts of questions kind of in the future, um, here's the sort of things I want you to think about in order to see whether there, it could, there could be selection. Is there variation? Is it heritable? So is this a genetic trait? And is there differential survival? So you notice some of the slides are white and some are blue. Blue slides are Gordon's. That means these are things that Gordon's thinks important that might be, you know, on, exam. <laughs> on your exams. Yeah. So I just want to point out this isn't just something I'm sharing with you. Um, so yeah, this list of what is necessary for natural selection, it really is important. Um, 
if these things aren't present, variation, heritability, and selection, there won't be evolution by natural selection. If things are true, there will be. It's a logical necessity. So this is really the most important slide of what I'm going to do then. Any questions on this? Yeah. It's a little out there, one, but one of the things I wrote down against with selection, this is totally out of curiosity, is like if there is a linkage disequilibrium or if you, nearsightedness happen to have like an epigenetic or some kind of a linkage to another really beneficial trait. So like if it was correlated with like intellect, for example, or something else. It's again, that's still back to the selection argument, but I, it's totally out of curiosity if linkage could have, like if it were a link gene to something. Did you guys understand what you're asking? She's basically saying, well, maybe there's some other, maybe eyesight is not advantageous or disadvantageous, but there is another linked gene, like something about intellect, that was under selection, and eyesight changed because that was selected for. Yes, that would be, just curious, I could do it, for sure. And basically, you'd be talking about this, there'd be variation in some other trait right. uh, that was genetic, that affected survival, and linked traits kind of follow along. Okay, um, I just wanted now to compare our, what, what we've just said about selection with what you've learned about Hardy-Weinberg. So Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium says allele frequencies won't change. And uh, the Hardy-Weinberg model had random mating with a large, uh, infinitely large population with no selection, with no immigration, no mutation. Basically what we just did is we took the Hardy-Weinberg model and we just changed one uh, thing. We removed one of those assumptions. And you can almost look at all population genetics as modifications to the Hardy-Weinberg model where you change one thing after another. Right? You talked about mutation, you talked about um, finite population sizes. I think you're going to talk about gene flow next. Okay. Uh, I want to go over a few examples now of natural selection working um, in the wild. I think we'll just go um, one of the th a nice examples, maybe I shouldn't have used the word nice, nice. nice <laughs> selection, <laughs> nice evolution gender. occurring, uh, is antibiotic resistance. And for those of you that go on to medical careers, there's just more and more examples of this. This is from uh, the BBC News. Apparently, in England now, there's a form of gonorrhea they can't treat. And I, I think we're used to living in a world where a lot of these diseases are treatable, and Boy, it's a little scary to think about what it might be if they weren't. And there's more and more examples of diseases like tuberculosis that are getting harder and harder to treat. And this may be one of the big challenges of 21st, med 21st century medicine, to see whether medical technology can keep up with the rate of evolution that's occurring in these pathogens. Um, this is Gordon's slide. What does Gordon have to say? 25% uh, of uh, Pneumonia cases in Atlanta were resistant to penicillin. 25% um, of cases were resistant to more than one antibiotic. One out of seven new TB cases resistant to the most commonly used drugs. This, you see this over and over again yeah, in hospitals. Implications for fish and wildlife management. Okay. Uh, implications of this for fish and wildlife management. It's a Gordon's life. <laughs> Gordon's life. Watching me squirm. Um, you gonna say something? <laughs> yeah, what you gonna say? Yeah, go I try Defer. to bring it back occasionally to applications of fish and wildlife management because there's so many students in here yeah. that are interested in that sort of thing. And so bring it back. Wait, we this Can I try? Sure. Yeah. Examples because yeah. diseases are. Well, if you even take the example of like if you are looking at agriculture when you're pumping antibiotics into our cows and livestock and then they're intermingling with wild animals that don't have these antibiotics, then the bacteria get to grow and thrive, they become resistant and the mutated ones do even better in the wild populations and it causes the same push that it would in people and can cause more harmful bacteria to wild populations as well. Most wildlife populations are like there's mo mostly zoonotic sources of mm -hmm. human diseases. So human pathogens start in wildlife. Mm -hmm. Which, but we're not dosing wildlife with antibiotics. So. 
I would think of like it the opposite way. It's like, well, you bring a new disease into a population, and initially you might kill a bunch of the big one sheep or the trout with a whirling disease, but you'd hope at some point the population would become resistant, which would be nice. Um, What's that? I said or it just doesn't survive. It doesn't survive, so That's another option. Let, let me just back up. <laughs> Here's our list of what you need for natural selection to work. So if you have a population of big red sheep and the disease comes in, from a conservation point of view, you yeah, want what you're wondering is like, oh boy, I hope they have the variation that they need to to survive. So when you were showing these graphs of number of alleles being lost through genetic drift. Those like colored lines were just kind of really abstract things on a computer screen. But I think it's important to realize that those are real genes and species that we care about. And those lines being lost in genetic drift could be the allele that that trout needs to survive that disease. And boy, when it's gone from the population, that population you know, may have lost its ability to respond to something, which could be a real tragedy. Okay. Um, antibiotic resistance. Uh, another example of selection, these are just examples. These are two different subspecies of mouse. This is the old field mouse in the first problem that you looked at. And these mice here live in the forest. They're, you know, kind of a beautiful shade of brown. You see them kind of in the background. They hide quite well. There's a little island here, Santa Rosa Island. The mice that live there um, are white. They blend into that sand really well. And that difference in coat color is determined by the melanocortin-1 receptor. So here's that DNA sequence. And this one specific gene plays a really important role in hair color in kind of all the mammals. So spirit bears, this is a black bear that's white which I think Gordon had a few slides on it. Uh, redheads in humans, it's because they have a mutation here, and the mice have a mutation here. Um, with these mice, you change one nucleotide, and that's responsible for most of the change in this color. So that's an adaptation in this species that's been favored by natural selection, just that one nucleotide. So, exam so presumably what's happened is there's a mutation here, created light for mice living on the beaches were selected for. So variation, inheritance, and selection. There's a biologist at Harvard, Hopi Hochstra, that did this work. She's made her career doing the most simple, obvious stuff. It's like, yeah, if you ask me, you know, what gene would you look at to, to find this sort of adaptation? I would have said one accord and one receptor. She was the one that thought of doing it. So she spent her whole career like publishing in science and nature, and it's all really obvious. <laughs> um, she just has that gift of finding the right question. Um, other examples of natural or selection going on kind of in contemporary America. Bed bugs are getting harder and harder to kill. You put a pesticide on bed bugs, and no longer kills them. Okay, so this is one of Gordon's slides here. Um, one of the nice things about being a geneticist in the 21st century is we can look at lots of different loci, you can look at genomes, and you can find the genetic basis of traits like this. So with bed bugs, um, for the, the pesticides that have been used to kill them have affected the bugs kind of in multiple ways. So 14 different loci um, have been affected to create a bed bug that is resistant to these pesticides. You know, it probably affects their shell, the way they absorb chemicals, maybe the way they metabolism works, things like that. So they've changed in lots of different ways. Gordon, anything else on the bed bugs? No, I just wanted to mention gene expression as a, because we hadn't talked about it yet. Uh -huh. We won't talk about it a lot, but it's one mechanism of adaptation. Yeah, let me say another thing on that. So this example here is, shows how selection has been caused by a point mutation. 
This actually is a pretty unusual sort of example. Most examples of natural selection kind of occurring contemporarily now are in gene expression. This is really the way you want mind wants to think about it. It's nice and simple, but gene expression seems to be um, probably more important. Okay, what else do we have? Oh, here's an example in humans. Uh, potential selection that might be going on in humans. This is a white blood cell here in our immune system. This is the HIV virus. The way HIV gets in the white blood cells is they bind with the CCR5 protein. Don't ask me about the details, but apparently this protein is on HIV. You need to interact with this protein. Um, some humans have a different variant of their CCR5 protein. This is a normal DNA sequence that most of us probably have, but some people have uh, a 32 base pair deletion in this protein. And if you have that deletion in this protein, HIV can't bind and can't get in your white blood cells, so you're resistant to HIV. So if, you have, if you're homozygous for this allele, then you're not going to get HIV. Um, so if there's enough selection um, and, you know, caused by AIDS in humans, you might expect this allele to increase in frequency. Let's hope, you know, that medical care um, <coughs> protects people so we don't have to see uh, this occurring, but um, it's another example of natural, of potential natural selection occurring in humans. Okay. Gordon, I didn't know how much you wanted to say about coevolution, so I left these slides in here. I think what you wanted to say is multiple species can affect each other. So if you have cheetahs eating antelope, um, as the cheetahs get faster, they'll put a selective pressure on the antelope to run faster. As the antelope run faster, the cheetahs are going to have to run faster. So species can affect each other that way. Um, and this sort of thing you'll often see with just pathogens and their hosts. Um, so going back to HIV, if I can make an example. Um, if there was enough HIV so that everyone had these alleles now, so we're protected, the sort of thing you'd expect is that HIV would eventually evolve to find a new way into our white blood cells. So that sort of thing can go on with evolution. And Gordon had some slides about uh, rabbits in Australia. And I'm not sure what he wanted to say. Oh, we can skip through it, but it is one of the more fun examples, and I haven't, you know, <laughs> reviewed this recently. But host disease is often a really strong force of selection, um, and so that it's one of the host parasite and host pathogen interactions provides some of the best examples of natural selection in action or you know that we can learn from uh, and this is a case where both the rabbit and the host were studied substantially and they demonstrated that they both changed so the host had increased resistance and the virus had reduced virulence over time so they, you know you know the story about rabbits in australia right they brought a few dozen rabbits to australia because they thought it might be nice to hunt them there weren't really enough predators there to stop the population. The rabbits increased exponentially, took over the continent, drove native species extinct, you know, drove a lot of ranchers out of business. It was just a total huge mess. And they brought in the disease, this uh, myxoma virus, to kill the rabbits. Initially it killed, I don't know, 99% of them. But the 1% that survived had genes that protected them. Uh, they reproduced, passed those genes on, and the rabbits kind of evolved to be um, more resistant because there was variation, inheritance, and selection. Okay, um, I wasn't sure how far Gordon wanted to go in this direction. And Gordon, you can kind of lay allele, so there's fixation of an allele, or will natural selection maintain polymorphism of multiple alleles? Okay, and I, I'm gonna do that by discussing a case study this is from the other conservation genetics textbook out there. Um, condor dystrophy in the California captive breeding program. So you probably know who condors are, they're big vultures. They eat um, carrion. Historically, they lived in the southwestern part of the United States. Um, 1987, there was only a couple dozen birds left. And they were reared in captivity. Um, so this is 
high budget conservation. People spending lots of work trying to save the species from extinction. And it turns out that there was genetic problems in the species. Um, a, a substantial fraction of the birds uh, had condor dystrophy, which means kind of they had really um, sh very short versions of their limbs. And it's, it's lethal. So the birds would live for a short period of time, then they'd die. It's a trait. Uh, that's completely recessive, so only individuals that were homozygous for that, um, the little the deleterious allele would die, the other ones were fine. The frequency um, of the allele in captivity was 0.1, and managers were wondering, like, well, if this is a deleterious allele, it's um, lethal, maybe we can just let selection run its course. So, Let's explore the question now, if we just let selection run its course, if we randomly make these condors and let the ones that have this trait die, what will happen? How will selection change the frequency of this allele? So here you have a graph of a bunch of different possibilities. It could stay the same, it could stay the same and then plummet, it could decrease in frequency and then um, kind of stay at an equilibrium, or maybe because it's lethal it's just going to plummet down there or something else. So what path is it going to take? How do we start that discussion? Are there any of these that we can eliminate? Are there any of these that we can? Probably the red line. It, it, the red line. Is this the red line? Mm -hmm. Why eliminate the red line? Because it won't go completely to that mutation can't go completely to extinction because the um, heterozygote is still viable. <clears throat> okay, so the heterozygote is still viable. So this is the red line. So if the heterozygote is still viable, what's that mean? Does that mean it's going to do this? That it's going to do, it'll never get eliminated because there will always be some copies? Yeah. How about, and, it yeah. could get eliminated. What's that? It could get eliminated. Could? If you yeah. had um, your homozygous for the dominant allele in both. Homozygous. But your big A, big A, or whatever, in both parents. But they don't well, I mean, like, when I say eliminate, I mean from the population. What's going to happen to this little A? Well, let me ask a question. What about this black line? What can you say about this? What line is this? This line has a name. Fixation one? Harry Weinberg line, oh. right? This is Harry Weinberg, it doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Can we eliminate that? Yeah. yeah. Right, because there is selection. Because there is selection, so it's going to be one of these. How about this one? Yeah. Is it going to just go? Mm -hmm. No, okay. It's not going to go there. So what do you, what's left that we like? Anyone have a favorite line? Yeah, uh, I can't see it. Like the brownish brown line. Brown line? Brown line? <laughs> Any other lines that people like? I like the orange yellow. line. The orange line, this one? Yeah. So these two lines, these are the ones you guys like? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about what we think might happen. How can we make a logical argument to differentiate between these? The brown line says it's going to decrease in frequency, presumably due to selection. And then it's not changing, so that's saying it's going to be a new equilibrium. Yeah, I don't like that. And this line says it's going to keep going, looks like it keeps going down. Which of those? in captivity because it says they live for a couple days and then the they all die yeah. well that's not going to change any differently in the wild so it's i mean the chicks are still going to live a couple days they'll still be born but they're going to die eventually but not gonna they're them. still going to be born like they're still going uh -huh. to be heteros so if you have homozygous chicks being born that means obviously you still have heterozygous parents so it has to be maintained to some level within the population it can't be continually declining unless there is a differential between the success of homozygous versus heterozygous to be dominant. Okay, I think that makes sense. Like the only way it would completely get selected out is if there's a success in a difference in success for reproducing if you're homozygous for the dominant and heterozygous. If they're both reproducing at the same success rate then it shouldn't ever completely be cleansed from the population. I think there's a couple things here. So I heard you say it may not be completely cleansed. Mm -hmm. 
but I want to comment on that. Now, one of the differences between these lines is this one is flat up here. This one, closer and closer. So it may not be completely cleansed, but will it keep going down? Let's think about that. Will the frequency of this little keep being reduced? So let's not worry about will it actually get to zero. You know how like, calculus goes. A lot of lines keep going down, but they never get to zero. Maybe that, will that occur here? Do we want to like make an argument for it'll always be going down? So in each successive population, anyone with the header is that anyone with the dominant allele will potentially pass on all of their genes, but anyone with only recessive alleles will drop out of the population. So it'll be losing a percentage of those recessive alleles with each subsequent generation. Hold on, so every generation, the homozygous, homozygous recess recessive will they're all going to so they're not passing those alleles on. So they're going to die. Die. So, so think of it this way. The allele frequency is Q. What are my genotype frequencies? P squared, 2PQ, and Q squared, right? You don't even have to know what P and Q is. That's always going to be true, right? You randomly make these birds, P squared, 2 PQ, and Q squared. The Q squared fraction is going to die every generation. What happens when you do that? What happens to the frequency of the little a? Logarithmic decline. It goes down. Okay? <clears throat> so the frequency of little a is always going to go down when you have a deleterious lethal, deleterious recessive. Now, May, may never go to zero, but it's always going to go down, okay? It won't be an equilibrium here. So when you have this sort of trait, that's what's going to occur. Um, and I don't think this is something you're going to do in this course, but you can make mathematical models to see how populations are going to evolve. The way those models work is you say, well, there's genotypes with different alleles. You just, Say, well, the random mating, the frequency of these genotypes are P squared, 2PQ, Q squared. And then you have their fitnesses. Hopefully, the, I'm assuming this is something that's familiar from evolution, maybe. These, these fitnesses are kind of how well individuals survive or reproduce. You can express them in an absolute sense or in a relative sense. I'm, I'm going quickly here because I think you have this. And you can make this model, and when you do that, um, you can calculate out uh, what should happen. If you do that, like when I teach a full version of this course, I have my students do that. This will be um, how the frequency of that recessive lethal will change. That's how the mathematical model predicts. So it was 0.1, it goes down quickly, and then, boy, it starts going slow. Why would selection reduce the frequency of this allele slowly here? It wasn't occurring frequently, is what someone's. Relative frequency. Relative frequencies. So this is, it's at point one. Down here, I don't know, it's around point one. Why, oh, one? Why is it select? So, so evolution is a change in allele frequencies. See how flat this line is? This line is not changing quickly. Evolution is really slowed down here. Natural selection is not working very well. Why? there's very few homozygotes at that point? Yeah, there's so few homozygotes. If Q is 0 0.01, what's 0 0.01 times 0 0.01? 1 out of 10,000. 1 out of 10,000 birds is homozygous. So it, natural select, the rate of natural selection is not fast when you're selecting against a recessive trait. Um, now, this was a mathematical model that was predicting what should happen. Here's some real data. So this is a flower beater po population um, where the three fitnesses were one of them was zero. So it's this, exactly the case that I just gave you. This is a recessive lethal. This is what the mathematical model says should happen in a population. It should decrease in frequency according to this line. Um, and the circles and triangles, I'm assuming, are different replicate populations where this has occurred, and you can see they follow the line quite well. So this is pretty much, this does occur. I 
Okay, here's a question. <clears throat> so the example that I just gave you was where we had a recessive leap or if you were heterozygous, you were completely fine. Imagine for a second if being heterozygous, you weren't quite as healthy. So the heterozygote maybe had a 10% less chance of surviving than over here. So here, homozygote healthy, heterozygote's healthy. Here, boy, you're not going to live. Now we're just going to tweak this just a little. Homozygote's completely healthy. Heterozygote just is not quite as healthy. How will this locus evolve compared to this locus? If the heterozygote's being selected against just a little, Will it be a little different or a real big difference? Big difference. Big difference? Take a look. This was the recessive lethal case. Selection just doesn't ever want to get rid of the allele. If you just put a little bit of selection on the heterozygote, it's like, boom! It gets much more efficient because no matter what genotype you have, homozygous recessive or the heterozygote selection is operating on you, so it can be much more efficient. Okay, um, here are some examples of, this is natural selection occurring in fruit flies, where now selection is favoring something instead of going against something. Uh, these are fruit flies with alleles that help them metabolize um, alcohol more quickly. So this is the ADHF allele, F meaning um, these individuals can break down ethanol, which is a toxin, more quickly. You start them off um, at frequency of 0.5. Um, individuals with, I'm sorry, yeah, the frequency of the allele that helps these flies metabolize ethanol increases when you put them in an environment where there are a lot of ethanol. So selection for something. How much do you want to go into all this, Gordon? I started realizing why I really got into it making the slideshow, and I don't really know how far you well, want to you're go. Pretty good already, actually, covering directional selection. What's that? You've done a pretty good job already. Okay. Um, let me just, let me let me just make a couple more points here. Um, what are, I think one thing I want you to know is. What sort of conditions will selection allow, will lead to fixation? What sort of fitnesses will lead to an allele going, either being eliminated from a population or going to fixation? So here's three examples of when that will occur. We have our three genotypes, A1, 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 A2, A2, A2. If this homozygous recessive allele is less fit, allele A2 will get eliminated. Well, now you can imagine the heterozygotes being selected against, the same thing is occurring. Or now here you have it, what you might call an additive model, this allele will get eliminated. So the pattern here is if one of the homozygotes is fitter than the other, and the heterozygote isn't the highest, selection will eliminate the less fit allele. Let me just so in the again. first one, that it, the A2 allele will be, 2 will never, what's that? It'll never drop out of the population, right? No, no, in all these cases here, a, allele A2 is going to be eliminated. But isn't that the same as in yeah. our condor situation? Oh, 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 let me go back to that. Yeah. So you're saying here it'll never be eliminated? Yeah. I think this is one of the differences between kind of a mathematical model and reality. This mathematical model says, yeah, it'll never be eliminated, but the frequency of that allele is going to go down to 0.01, 1 out of 1,000, 1 out of 10,000, 1 out of a million. From my perspective, I'm going to say, boy, that's being eliminated. Mm -hmm. Although the model says it'll just get lower and lower. Thank you. Yeah, and if you add in a little drift, right. 
That's <laughs> right. Sprinkle. Well, then eventually you start adding these different mechanisms yeah. together. Okay, so each of these scenarios here, our allele A2 will be lost. Or it's being selected against just here, which is to say it's recessive. Here it's dominant, and here it's additive. As long as the header, if the heterozygote is not the highest, one of the alleles will be lost if there's selection going on. Here's another way of saying that. One, this genotype has a low fitness, this genotype has a high fitness. This could have anything in the middle. That is kind of like an interval, low to high. If this goes on, this allele will be lost, allele A2. Um, that, those are the conditions in which you lose alleles. Next, I want to go talking about, well, how can selection maintain alleles? And I start that discussion with question number three on our worksheet. Why don't you read that? Or I'll, 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 I'll pitch it to you, and then we can talk about it. So cystic fibrosis, does anyone know from a family member I know someone with cystic fibrosis? Could you tell us what it's? About what life with cystic fibrosis is like? Oh, yeah, they're on breathing machines and feeding tubes. It's my cousin. He has two daughters that are twins. Uh -huh. And they both have it. And they're four. And they had to move to Wisconsin so that they could get their weekly and monthly treatments. It's, their life's dedicated to it. It's, it's the medical it's care for life. cystic fibrosis yeah. is, is very involved, yeah. It's a pretty serious uh, genetic condition. Um, apparently, with your cystic fibrosis, kind of the production of mucuses in different parts of your body um, is is different, and so you know there's mucuses in your lungs, and breathing can be very hard. Until kind of modern medical care was available, you wouldn't expect a child to be born with cystic fibrosis to make it to the first birthday. Very serious um, genetic disease. Now, you know, thankfully, modern medical care can get people to live much longer. Um, okay, so it's a genetic disorder in humans. Now, one of the things that's unusual about it is that the allele that causes it is 20 times more common in Europeans than in Africans or East Asians. So the allele that causes it is a single, it's one locus, a uh, recessive genetic dis trait, and it's 20 times more common in Europeans than other parts of the world. Why might that be? Yeah, let's, let's talk about, let's, let's, it's 11 now. Why don't we talk about it by, as a whole group instead of breaking it up? So we're talking, let's just frame it this way. We're talking about allele frequencies. They're more common in Europe than elsewhere. So you might think, well, maybe it's changed, right? It's, 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 it's gotten higher, it has a higher frequency in Europe. What would what could increase the frequency of allele? Let's go over our list of causes of evolution. What could